February 14, 1980, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. After driving off in his girlfriend's car, 25-year-old Michael Rosenblum vanishes without a trace. The vehicle is soon found abandoned, but the Baldwin Borough Police Department keep it impounded for over three months without informing anyone. As the years go by, Michael's father uncovers disturbing information to suggest the Baldwin police chief helped orchestrate a cover-up involving his son's disappearance. In 1992, a skull fragment belonging to Michael is found in a wooded area, but the circumstances of his death remain unclear. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 11 of The Trail Went Cold. I am your host Robin Warder and today I am going to be chronicling a case from the very first season of Unsolved Mysteries, The Unexplained Disappearance and Death of Michael Rosenblum, which was featured on the program on January 11, 1989. This was one of my personal favorite segments on the show and pretty much a case study on what Unsolved Mysteries was good for. Here was a victim who had been missing for nearly nine years at this point and his family had pretty much reached the end of their rope. Not only had law enforcement completely bungled the investigation of this case, but there was a good possibility they were covering something up as well. So the Rosenblums took their story to Unsolved Mysteries, and it turned out to be one of the most extensive, convoluted stories they ever featured, as the finished segment ran nearly 20 minutes long. Uh, I have previously featured this case in an article I published at listfirst.com titled 10 Controversial Missing Persons Cases, which was originally published in August of 2013. And the case certainly is controversial, as law enforcement actually flat out refused to cooperate with Unsolved Mysteries during the filming of this story. Uh, during my research, I found lots of articles about this case in the Google News archives, and I uncovered a lot of interesting information which didn't even get covered in the Unsolved Mysteries segment. But we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, before we get started, let's get some business out of the way first. Uh, the Trail Went Cold now has its own PayPal account and a new donate button on the website for anyone who's feeling generous. Uh, no pressure, but I have seen posters say on Reddit that they would be willing to donate to this podcast, so if there's anyone out there who feels like they want to make a donation, we would be absolutely flattered and greatly appreciated. Uh, I want to take this time to thank all my loyal listeners and supporters out there, especially those from the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit and the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the sitcoms on Line forum. The uh, Trail Went Cold runs on a bi-weekly schedule, and a new episode is posted every other Wednesday. We've got our own Facebook and Twitter pages, and another big thank you to all of my followers there. Uh, we're also available for download on several platforms now, including iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Music. So if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it. Uh, if you give us a rating or a review at any of these places, you're opening the door for us to get more exposure and garner us some potential new listeners. I need to provide the obligatory shout-out to McGill Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and is my fellow co-owner of The Back Row, the pop culture website which hosts this very podcast. And of course, a big shout out to Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode, and is constantly producing great new tracks to keep this podcast presentation fresh. So with that out of the way, let's begin, shall we? Our story begins in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1980, and our central figure is 25-year-old Michael Rosenblum. Uh, Michael is currently living with his parents, Maurice and Barbara Rosenblum, uh, but has spent the last several years struggling with an addiction to prescription painkillers. Uh, he has had a few run-ins with the law and been arrested a few times because of this, and he has done numerous stints in drug rehab programs. Things finally reach their breaking point on the evening of February 13th when Barbara discovers a bottle of painkillers in Michael's bedroom. Uh, at this point, Michael is only one month removed from his last stint in rehab, so his mother decides to put her foot down and implement what she calls tough love. She kicks Michael out of the house and tells him not to come back until he gets clean. But unfortunately, this would be the last time Barbara ever saw her son. Uh, anyway, Michael spent the night with his girlfriend, Lisa Scherer, a former Playboy bunny who had her own issues with drugs. In fact, the two of them actually met while they were in a drug treatment program together. Uh, when Michael woke up the following morning, he had what appeared to be a severe drug hangover, so Lisa became very concerned and decided to drive him to a hospital. However, Michael would become very agitated, and he flat out refused treatment. Uh, after they left the hospital together in Lisa's car, uh, she wound up nicking one of the tires, so they had to stop at a nearby gas station to fill the tire up with air. 
air. And it was here that Michael and Lisa got into a heated argument, and he suddenly got behind the wheel of the car and backed into a telephone pole. Uh, he then told Lisa he needed to borrow the vehicle and for him to meet him back at his parents' house in two hours. He then drove off and flat out stranded Lisa at the gas station, and he did this even though she also had her three-year-old daughter with her at the time. Uh, Lisa would actually end up hitchhiking to a psychiatric institute and instantly checked herself back into a drug treatment program. But, unfortunately, this would turn out to be the last official confirmed sighting of Michael Rosenblum. So, uh, needless to say, Michael did not show up at his parents' house that day. Uh, by the following day, no one had seen or heard from Michael, so his parents started to become very concerned. Maurice Rosenblum then went to the Pittsburgh Police Department and reported his son missing. And of course, not only had Michael disappeared, but Lisa's car was nowhere to be found either, so the Pittsburgh PD notified all their different boroughs and circulated the information about both Michael and the missing vehicle. Well, several weeks went by and there was still no sign of Michael or Lisa's car, so Maurice Rosenblum would begin what became a very long and tireless search for his son, as he traveled all over the place to post up missing persons flyers, he offered a reward, and he contacted pretty much everyone Michael had ever known to see if he could find if they knew what happened to his son. Uh, during this time period, none of the money in Michael's bank account was touched, so it seemed less and less likely that he was still alive. Uh, Maurice also got an anonymous phone call from someone who claimed that Michael had been arrested, but since the caller abruptly hung up, Maurice just assumed that it was a prank. But that only turned out to be the start of what would become a journey into a very deep rabbit hole. Well, they finally did get a hit on Lisa's missing car. She was informed that it was now sitting in a police-bonded tow yard in the Baldwin Borough, which is a suburb of Greater Pittsburgh. Uh, it turns out that the Baldwin Borough Police Department had found the vehicle abandoned on River Road, which overlooked the Monongahela River, and connected the Baldwin Borough with Pittsburgh's south side. Uh, two of the tires were flat, the keys were missing, and the engine was cool, but Michael himself was nowhere to be found. So the police had Lisa's vehicle towed to an auto body place, but there was one serious problem here. The car was found on February 14th, only two hours after Michael drove away from the gas station. But neither Lisa nor Michael's family were informed about this, and they did not find out the vehicle was in the tow yard until May 21st. And the only reason Lisa was contacted was because the owner of the tow yard discovered that the car was on a list of stolen vehicles. And if that hadn't happened, who knows how long the car would have stayed there. Now, like I said earlier, after Michael was reported missing, the Pittsburgh PD had circulated information about Lisa's car to all of their boroughs, including Baldwin. It was officially confirmed that a Baldwin police dispatcher did receive the info about the car, but no one knows how much it was actually circulated. What everyone did know, however, was that the Baldwin PD had found the vehicle immediately after Michael disappeared, but inexplicably did nothing about it for three months. So as you can imagine, Maurice was absolutely furious about this, since a lot of valuable time had now been wasted in the search for Michael. The Baldwin PD claimed they did try to phone Lisa about the car, but couldn't get a hold of her. They also produced a copy of a letter which they claimed had been mailed to Lisa, informing her that her car was impounded at the tow yard. The letter was dated February 15th and signed by Chester Lombardi, one of the police officers who found the vehicle, but Lisa claimed she never received it. Now, to be fair, Lisa did check herself into drug treatment right after Michael disappeared, so it didn't seem that implausible that things could have gotten crossed up and she genuinely could not have received the letter. But there would be a lot more sketchy incidents involving the Baldwin police. So, shortly after finding out about Lisa's car, Maurice received another weird anonymous phone call, but this time, the caller specifically said Michael was arrested by the Baldwin police, before they hung up. And things soon got even weirder. On July 15th, Maurice learned that an arrest warrant had been issued for Michael, as he had apparently committed an armed robbery at a pharmacy on April 28th, two and a half months after he originally disappeared. And well, just because Michael was a missing person didn't necessarily mean he wasn't capable of committing a robbery, and a pharmacy would seem like an ideal target for someone with addiction issues. However, a lot of things about the arrest warrant just didn't add up. The composite sketch of the perpetrator did look like Michael, but there was one problem. According to eyewitnesses, the suspect was wearing large aviator sunglasses during the robbery, but for some reason, he was not wearing sunglasses in the composite sketch, which is highly unusual. Why would they draw the suspect's eyes when the witnesses never even saw what his eyes looked like? And the weird part was that the sketch had a striking resemblance to the photo of Michael which was being used on his missing persons flyer. It almost looked like someone had used the flyer as their blueprint to draw up the composite sketch. Anyway, the Pittsburgh Police Missing Persons Bureau soon asked the Baldwin PD to withdraw the arrest warrant for Michael, and it wasn't long before they found the real perpetrator, who confessed to the robbery and claimed that Michael had nothing to do with it. But things had gotten so sketchy that Maurice Rosenblum was convinced the Baldwin PD were hiding something, so he asked the Pennsylvania Attorney General to launch an investigation. Uh, the Attorney General's office did just that in 1983, but they found no evidence that the Baldwin PD had committed any wrongdoing, and concluded that the letter to Lisa Scherer probably just got lost in the mail. But this would not be the end of this story, not by any means. 
By 1986, there were still no answers about what happened to Michael, but then Maurice received an anonymous letter which claimed that the Baldwin police chief, Aldo Gaburi, had completely mishandled the case, and it advised Maurice to speak with Margaret Jean Hazlitt, a former dispatcher with the Baldwin PD who was now living in Massachusetts. Well, Maurice tracked Hazlitt down, and she provided him with a jaw-dropping story. Apparently, in May of 1980, Chief Gaburi ordered his clerk, Fred Capelli, to type up a letter to Lisa Scherer, informing her that her car had been found abandoned on River Road and was now being held in a tow yard. But then the chief told Capelli to backdate the letter to February 15th, the, the day after the vehicle was found. Well, Maurice then went to talk to Fred Capelli, and he actually corroborated the story, but he also added a few more disturbing details. After the letter was typed up, Gabori approached Chester Lombardi, the officer who found Lisa's vehicle, and asked him to sign it, but Lombardi refused to do so because the letter had been backdated three months. So Gabori then ordered Capelli to forge Lombardi's signature on the letter. Gabori then had this backdated letter placed in the file, so when the Pittsburgh PD came around asking why the hell no one contacted Lisa about her missing car, he produced this letter as evidence that a letter had already been sent to her on February 15th. Unfortunately, Chester Lombardi had died of a heart attack a few years before Maurice heard these allegations, so Maurice could not actually confirm the story with him. However, he did get in touch with Robert Weber, the police officer who found Lisa's car alongside Lombardi, and Weber claimed that Chief Gaburi had also approached him about signing his name to the backdated letter, but he also refused to do so. And as you can probably imagine, the shit hit the fan. Maurice responded by writing an angry letter to the Baldwin Borough Council, demanding a full investigation into Chief Kaburi and the Baldwin Police Department. A hearing was held on this matter in October of 1987, and Margaret Jean Hazlitt, Fred Capelli, and Robert Weber all gave sworn testimony in which they shared their allegations against Kaburi, uh, while a handwriting expert testified that he believed that the signature on the letter was Chester Lombardi's, Lombardi's widow testified that she did not believe the signature was her husband's. In the end, the council voted to fire Chief Gaburi over this whole mess. However, Gaburi filed an appeal, and the Baldwin Civil Service Commission soon held another hearing in which they voted to overturn the decision and reinstated Gaburi, claiming they did not find the witnesses who testified against him to be credible. But by the sound of things, Gaburi was actually good friends with a lot of people on that commission. In fact, he was known for being buddy-buddy with the mayor of Baldwin, and there were rumors that Gabori did a lot of special favors for him, like voiding any traffic tickets he received. So, Chief Gabori went back to work, and Maurice Rosenblum was pretty much back at square one. But in 1988, Maurice Rosenblum heard about this new television program named Unsolved Mysteries. He decided to bring his son's story to them, and the show agreed to profile the case. Now, when producing their segments, it was standard practice for Unsolved Mysteries to travel to the actual locations their stories took place in order to conduct interviews and film reenactments. They would often work directly with law enforcement, since the majority of the time, police do have a vested interest in getting their cases solved. But in this particular situation, Chief Kaburi ensured that neither he nor anyone else from the Baldwin PD would have any involvement in the production of the Unsolved Mysteries segment. So no one from the department was interviewed or had any participation in the whole segment. And here's another sketchy story. It was eventually leaked out that the anonymous writer who sent the letter to Maurice was a Baldwin police officer named George Galovich, who had become quite disillusioned with his workplace. An Unsolved Mysteries producer left a message on Galovich's answering machine to inquire about filming an interview with him. Fifteen minutes later, the producer received a call back from Galovich, who not only refused to do an interview, but tried to discourage the show from even coming to Baldwin to film the segment. Well, it turns out that the caller was not actually George Galovich. It turned out to be Galovich's roommate, who was also a Baldwin police officer and a much bigger supporter of Chief Gaburi. Only two hours after this phone call took place, Galovich learned he had been suspended and he was eventually fired from the police force. Anyway, for the segment, Unsolved Mysteries filmed a search effort which took place on a steep bluff near River Road in the same area where Michael went missing. Uh, they ended up finding a bone fragment and scraps of clothing which seemed similar to what Michael was last seen wearing, but I'm not sure they were ever conclusively matched to him. In fact, I think the bone fragment they found turned out to belong to an animal. So the segment finally aired in January 1989, and the Unsolved Mysteries phone line received hundreds of tips. The most interesting one came from an anonymous man who claimed he had been arrested by the Baldwin PD for drunk driving on February 14, 1980, and he wound up sharing a cell with someone matching Michael's description. Uh, the caller claimed that the guy had been beaten and had a gunshot wound in his leg, and that after the police removed the guy from the cell, he never saw him again. They did eventually track this caller down, but there were a lot of inconsistencies in his story, and I don't think they uncovered any evidence to suggest it was true. And unfortunately, the case just wound up going cold again for the next three years. But in April 1992, a hiker discovered a human skull fragment in 40 acres, a large wooded area near River Road. This was only about a mile away from where Lisa's car was found. Uh, two months later, it was officially confirmed that the skull fragment belonged to Michael Rosenblum, but his exact cause of death was never determined. 
And unfortunately, that's pretty much the end of this story, as there haven't been any developments that I know of at all since 1992. Uh, Aldo Gaburi died in 1997, so if he had any knowledge about Michael's death, he took those secrets to the grave. So, I guess you could say, the trail went cold. So where do I begin with this one? Well, after you watch the Unsolved Mysteries segment, it's impossible not to feel immense sympathy for Maurice and Barbara Rosenblum, who both seem like genuinely nice people. Uh, even though Michael had a lot of issues with drugs, and dealing with his problems was not easy, the Rosenblums clearly never stopped loving their son. It's uh, pretty heartbreaking to watch Barbara when she talks about kicking Michael out of the house, as the one time she decided to put her foot down and implement tough love turned out to be the very last time she ever saw him. You really can't blame her, as she definitely thought she was doing the right thing at the time, but she was clearly haunted by her decision. And I've seen a lot of unsolved cold cases where parents fight diligently to find out the truth about what happened to their child, but Maurice Rosenblum is definitely one of the most awe-inspiring. He just came across as an all-around good father and good person who never gave up his search for the truth and spent over a quarter of a million dollars of his own money in an attempt to find his son. And sadly, Maurice passed away in 2008 without ever receiving any answers. Now, regardless of whether or not you believe they were directly responsible for Michael's death, I think the following facts are indisputable. The Baldwin Borough Police Department was a terribly run police force, and Aldo Gabori was a god-awful police chief. I have zero doubt there was a cover-up here, and that the story about Gabori typing up that backdated letter is 100% true. I know the Baldwin Civil Service Commission did not find the testimony of the three witnesses to be credible, but come on. We have three different people with no reason to lie providing the same corroborating story, and two of them, Fred Capelli and Robert Weber, they were still employed by the Baldwin PD at the time and were putting their jobs at serious risk by testifying. In one of the articles I read, the quote, Freddy doesn't have an original thought, is used to describe Fred Capelli. I don't want to insult the guy, but if you watch Capelli's interview on Unsolved Mysteries, he comes across as this frail, very simple old man who just does what he's told without thinking about it. You just cannot visualize this guy fabricating a false story about a police cover-up. I'm convinced that all this nonsense with the backdated letter actually happened, and that the Baldwin PD did orchestrate a cover-up. But here's the question you have to ask. Was this done to cover up foul play? Or was it done merely to cover up their own incompetence? You see... It's entirely possible that the Baldwin PD had nothing to do with Michael Rosenblum's death, and that Chief Gaburi only went to the trouble of fabricating that letter because he didn't want to admit his department screwed up. Maybe the only mistake they actually made was a stupid clerical error where they forgot to send out a letter, but when Michael never turned up, this little white lie of theirs just snowballed out of control and gave off the impression that they were hiding something a lot more sinister. And this theory isn't that implausible because you have to remember, Michael was not in a good place at that time. He was still struggling with drug addiction and behaving very erratically when he disappeared. A guy who would just drive off in his girlfriend's car and leave both her and her three-year-old daughter stranded at a gas station is not in a rational state of mind. There are numerous possibilities for how he might have died. When the vehicle's tires went flat on River Road, Michael could have very well abandoned the car and wandered off somewhere. He could have walked into a nearby wooded area and OD'd or just passed out and died of exposure. Hell, he could have just gone into the woods and committed suicide. At this point, Michael had pretty much hit rock bottom, having just been kicked out of his parents' house, and if the tires went flat while he was going through a bout of severe drug withdrawal, it very well could have been his breaking point, and it could have prompted him to end it all. I always wondered where exactly Michael was planning to go in Lisa's car that morning. I even pictured a scenario where he went off to score some drugs somewhere and got murdered. One of the Google News articles I found made a brief mention of Michael having an appointment that morning with an attorney over a recent traffic violation, but I can't be 100% sure if that's where he was actually going that time. But of course, given the state that Michael was in, if he did have an encounter with the police, I would not be surprised if something went terribly wrong. After watching the Unsolved Mysteries segment, it's very easy to feel suspicious about the Baldwin PD. And I gotta say, if they had no involvement in Michael's death, refusing to participate in the segment was a pretty lousy move on their part. Of course, this is hardly the only time that law enforcement declined to cooperate with Unsolved Mysteries. However, this was usually on segments where the featured case was officially closed, like say, the police had ruled someone's death a suicide, but the victim's family believed there was foul play and they wanted to keep the investigation going. But at the time Michael Rosenblum's story was filmed, his case was most certainly not closed. His skull fragment had not yet been found, so he was technically still a missing person. You'd think that after the debacle with the car and the backdated letter, Chief Gabori and his department might try to save face a little and work with Unsolved Mysteries to help get this case solved. But they refused to do that, which gave off the impression they were still hiding something and did not want anyone to find out what happened to Michael. 
But knowing how the Baldwin PD operated, their decisions simply might have been motivated by really, really lousy PR skills. And truth to be told, for years I was always on the fence about whether or not the police were involved in Michael's death, as there were some aspects of the cover-up theory which didn't make sense to me. If the police somehow killed Michael, I just wasn't sure why they'd go to the trouble of hiding his body. Because let's face it, when someone dies under suspicious circumstances at the hands of the police, their strategy generally involves concocting a cover story. If Michael was killed, they could have easily said it was self-defense or that he posed a threat of some sort. And since Michael was a known drug addict with an arrest record and a history of erratic behavior, people wouldn't have had trouble believing that story. And furthermore, if the police disposed of Michael's body, why would they keep his car around? Why not make the car disappear as well instead of keeping it around in a towing yard for three months? That's the part which made me think this whole thing might have been a simple case of good old-fashioned police incompetence, and that the only thing they actually tried to cover up was their screw-up with the letter. I was willing to believe that Michael died in some other fashion, and that this whole story was a cautionary tale about how lying about one little clerical error can escalate and backfire on a police department in huge fashion. However, while researching this case, I came across a magazine article which finally swayed me to one side of the fence, and it convinced me that the Baldwin police got away with murder. In May of 1988, a writer named Jim Harger published an extensive article about the Michael Rosenblum case in Pittsburgh Magazine, which was that particular issue's cover story and did not paint a flattering picture of the Baldwin PD. Baldwin was described as one of the most inept and corrupt police departments around, and one source was quoted as saying, When you cross the boundary lines from Pittsburgh into Baldwin, you leave the real world of law enforcement far behind you. Anyway, the article provided a lot of interesting details not mentioned in the Unsolved Mysteries segment. It specifies that the exact time officers Chester Lombardi and Robert Weber found Lisa's car on River Road was 12.24 p.m. That very same day, at 11.53 a.m., two other police officers, Warren Cooley and Donald Masenzik, left an office on the south side of Pittsburgh to go serve a warrant in McKeesport. According to police logs, they apparently never did arrive at their destination to serve the warrant, and they were not heard on the radio again until 2.30 that afternoon. There seems to be a window of over two and a half hours in which the whereabouts of Cooley and Masensic are unaccounted for. It's also worth noting that in order to travel from the south side to McKeesport, they would have to travel along River Road. There is literally no other route to get there. So it's reasonable to assume that Lisa's abandoned car probably would have been sitting there around the time that Cooley and Masensic drove down River Road. But they never reported anything over the radio. By itself, this information might not sound notable. But remember that suspicious arrest warrant which was issued for Michael Rosenblum five months later? Well, guess which officer investigated the robbery at the pharmacy and requested that warrant? Warren Cooley. It was Cooley who produced the composite sketch which resembled Michael's missing persons flyer, and he was the one who asked for the warrant after getting an ID on Michael from only one of the eyewitnesses in the robbery, which is not standard police procedure in these type of situations. Yet despite the questionable nature of this arrest warrant, Chief Kaburi personally signed off on it until the Pittsburgh PD stepped in and asked that the warrant be withdrawn. According to the article, Cooley did not have the most stellar reputation as a police officer, as there were allegations that he liked shaking people down for money in order to avoid legal problems. But that's not the only suspicious piece of information from the magazine. It also mentioned that an article was published about the case in the Pittsburgh Press on June 26, 1980. It featured a photograph of Lisa Scherer, which she claimed was taken from a photo album which was inside her car at the time Michael drove off with it. And according to Lisa, this album was missing when the vehicle was returned to her. So how did the Pittsburgh Press get a hold of this photo? Well, according to the reporter who wrote the article, it was provided to her by Chief Gaburi. And that's pretty strange, since Gaburi and Cooley would later testify under oath that they never made any contact with Lisa's vehicle. There really is no explanation for how that particular photo wound up in Gaburi's possession. Now, before I continue, I should add a disclaimer. After Pittsburgh Magazine published the article containing all these allegations, Warren Cooley and Donald Masenzik filed a defamation of character lawsuit against them. The case was on the verge of going to trial in March of 1990, when Cooley and Masenzik agreed to settle their suit with the magazine out of court, but the terms of the settlement were never disclosed. But this might explain why Unsolved Mysteries never mentioned all these incriminating details in their segment. Now, of course, since there was a lawsuit involved, I can't be certain that all the information presented by Pittsburgh Magazine was 100% accurate. But I have to think that some of the wording in the article played a role in the officer's decision to sue. Stephen Tursak, a former Pittsburgh police officer turned private investigator, was quoted as saying that he'd heard a theory that Cooley and Masenzik had chased Michael Rosenblum down, forced him off the road, assaulted Michael when he tried to fight back, accidentally killed him, and then got rid of the body. Of course, there's no evidence that this actually happened, and this theory is presented as nothing more than hearsay, but I can see why Cooley and Masenzik would think the article was accusing them of murder. But, just because the lawsuit was settled doesn't mean there might not have been some truth to these allegations. And I gotta say, 
I'm inclined to think that the scenario described in this article is exactly what happened. So here's my theory, and I'm reasonably comfortable that enough time has passed so that no one is going to sue me over this. I think that sometime between 11.53 a.m. and 12.24 p.m. on February 14, 1980, Officers Cooley and Mesensik were driving along River Road on their way to serve their warrant when they had an encounter with Michael Rosenblum. Maybe Michael was driving erratically and they tried to pull him over, but he led them on a chase and wound up flattening two of the tires. Or maybe the tires had already gone flat and Michael was stopped in the middle of the road, so the cops pulled over to investigate. Given that Michael was going through drug withdrawal and had been behaving erratically all morning, maybe the presence of these police officers set him off and something bad happened. If Cooley and Mesensic killed Michael, I'm inclined to believe that it didn't happen on River Road because there's often a lot of traffic that goes through that location, so I'm sure someone would have seen something. I think the two cops likely put Michael in their patrol car and drove him somewhere, possibly to teach him a lesson. But wherever they went, something went horribly wrong, and Michael wound up dead, accidentally or otherwise. Cooley and Mesensic then spend the next few hours cleaning up their mess and disposing of Michael's body, which is why they don't make any contact over the radio again until 2.30. It might seem strange that only Michael's skull fragment was discovered in the 40 acres wooded area, but over the course of 12 years, a lot of things can happen to a dead body. Maybe animals scattered the remains, so the skull fragment was found a great distance away from the rest of Michael's body. But I have a feeling that Michael was originally buried somewhere in 40 acres. Now here's where the cover-up started to fall apart. When Cooley and Mesensic took Michael away, they left his car behind on River Road, and shortly thereafter, it was discovered by officers Chester Lombardi and Robert Weber. I really don't believe that Lombardi or Weber were in on the cover-up, because when Chief Kaburi asked them to sign his backdated letter, they both refused. So they wind up towing Lisa's car away and getting the whole incident on the record, denying Cooley and Mesensic the opportunity to dispose of the vehicle themselves. They probably hope that the car will remain in the tow yard indefinitely and that no one will put two and two together, but the whole thing snowballs out of control once Lisa is informed that her car has been impounded for three months. And this is when Chief Gabori gets involved. I'd like to give Gabori the benefit of the doubt and believe he orchestrated this whole thing because he thought he was covering up a simple clerical error, but there's another piece of information which paints him in a very bad light. On May 22nd, Gabori finally decided to authorize a search effort for Michael in the River Road area, but by all accounts it was a pretty half-assed effort which was called off after only three hours, and most suspiciously, Gabori denied permission to anyone who wanted to search through certain sections of the River Road area, including 40 acres, because I'm sure by that point, he probably knew that Michael was buried there. And when you also account for the fact that Gabori somehow got a hold of Lisa's photo from her vehicle and provided it to the press, you gotta believe he had full knowledge of what happened. Not to mention that Gaburi personally authorized the suspicious warrant which Cooley had issued for Michael's arrest in July. These guys seemed to have a vested interest in creating the false impression that Michael Rosenblum was still alive. If it was just one or two of these incidents, I could write off this whole thing as a simple case of police covering up their own incompetence. But so much sketchy stuff seemed to happen over the course of eight years, and when you combine all these incidents together, it reeks of a police department with something really, really bad to hide. I think Aburi believed that the best course of action was to cover everything up and protect the reputation of his department, rather than charge two of his own officers with murder. In the end, my ultimate conclusion is that the Baldwin Borough Police Department were responsible for the death of Michael Rosenblum. But sadly, given that 36 years have passed and many of the major players in this case are now deceased, I'm not sure we'll ever learn the full truth about what happened. But like I've said before, no mystery is truly unsolvable, and we've seen many instances in the past few years where cold cases have finally wound up receiving closure after several decades. As I bring this episode to an end, I'd like to remind everyone out there that if by chance you have any information about the suspicious death of Michael Rosenblum, please contact the appropriate authorities. Well, maybe don't contact the Baldwin Borough Police Department, but please get in touch with someone. But if you just have your own theory about what happened, I would love to hear from you. If you have some more interesting information about this case which wasn't covered here in this episode, uh, feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email. If you'd like to get in touch, you can email me at robin.warder at icloud.com. That's R-O-B-I-N dot W-A-R-D-E-R at I-C-L-O-U-D dot com. Robin dot Warder at iCloud dot com. Also, be sure to check out The Trail Went Cold on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we're now available for download on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Music, so be sure to leave us a rating or a review at any of those places, because that will help garner us more exposure. And like I mentioned earlier, we also have a donate button on our website, so if you're feeling generous and want to express your appreciation for all the hard work we put into this podcast, we would be extremely grateful. Uh, you can also check out my true crime and mystery articles at crack.com and listverse.com, and there's plenty of other non-true crime content you can find right here at the back row. So, have yourself a good two weeks, and join me next time for another edition of The Trail Went Cold.
The Trail Went Cold is part of the Back Row Podcast Network. Visit d-back-row.com for more. The theme song was composed by Vince Nitro. Thank you.